dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to welcome you once again to this space of IPA webinars. As you might know, this is a long-term project organized by the website Editorial Committee. Our aim is to contribute to the discussion and transmission of central concepts of psychoanalytical theory, as well as uh, to receive interdisciplinary contributions on related themes. The IPA worldwide structure fosters the possibility of this open dialogue to share our ideas around the world. The title of today's webinar is uh, Contributing to the Scientific Development of Psychoanalysis, the Working Parties. As you might know, during the last two decades, working parties have progressively become one of the most requested and successful activities at psychoanalytical congresses, as well as in institutional training programs. Uh, currently, they are recognized as especially useful for the transmission and development of clinical experience, as well as valuable tools in the field of psychoanalytical research. Today, we'll have the opportunity to hear four members of our webinar committee. They are going to explain us how they work in the promotion of this very special scientific and clinical uh, activities around the world. Working parties go, goes far beyond our traditional meetings devoted to the discussion of clinical material. Thanks to the use of specific methodologies, the ideas that emerge from the working groups uh, provide the basis for an ulterior second level of discussion, of reflection, leading to the creation of new formalization of our theory. We'll be introduced also to the different models currently they are uh, around 10 different models, each with different methodologies aligned with their specific goals. Um, we'll learn uh, about uh, what elements in common do all these models have, and also we'll see which the differences are. Well, now we are ready to begin, but before uh, handing over to our panelists, I'll explain bre very briefly how the webinar is going to work. We have two sections. In the first section, we'll hear to the four panelists. The second section is a question and answer slot. All of you might send your uh, write and post your questions. Look at the right side of your screen on the control panel. We'll find a box entitled question. Please write and send your questions. You might begin now, but uh, remember that the questions are going to be answered after the panelist's presentation. You uh, also as attendees might download the panelist presentation. Again, go to the right side of the screen, a, a pane called Handouts. You simply have to click on the name of the text you want to download, at, and it will appear at your computer. Well, last comment. Remember that this is an open dialogue, and uh, all of us panelists and attendees, we are responsible of our own ideas. Well, now we are ready to begin, really. First, we'll hear Dr. Ruggiero Levy, but before 
we hand over to him, I'd like to read a very brief resume of his professional activities. Ruggiero is currently the chair of the IPA Working Parties Committee, full member and training analyst of the Psychoanalytic Society for Porto Alegre in Brazil. Here he served as president, director of the Institute of Psychoanalysis, scientific director of the Psychoanalytic Society and treasurer. He's ex-IPA board member, author of many scientific papers published in regional, national and international psychoanalytic reviews. Well, Ruggiero, it's your turn. Are you ready? Thank you, thank you very much, Ines. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank to all the webinar organizers for inviting us for this uh, to a so exciting and interesting activity uh, such as the, the webinar. I will begin my, my speech explaining more or less uh, what is the IPA Working Party Committee. We are a kind of steering committee of the working parties and our structure is composed by a chair that it's myself, as Ines already said, and uh, we have three co-chairs, one from each region. We have Bernard Reid for Europe, Mary Rudin for North America, and Agustina Fernandez for Latin America. We have also three other members, uh, one from each region. We have Leopoldo Blecher from Europe, Nancy Kulish from North America and Ines Bayona uh, for Latin America. We, the members of our committee, uh, we, we are individuals with knowledge and experience in different working parties and this is important because we have worked and we, we know how the working parties work and uh, we carry out our committee activities especially by virtual meetings and occasionally with in-person meetings at uh, events and, and congresses. Ines has already uh, spoke a little bit about what are the working parties, but I will go on and, uh, uh, and afterwards, after my speech, uh, Bernard also will uh, go on uh, explaining a little bit more about what are the working parties. The working parties are groups that have a goal to be investigated in the psychoanalytic clinic, in the training, or in the theoretical domain that operates in two levels. There is one uh, level that are the workshops that are carried out in the congresses or in some uh, societies when the groups are inviting, invited to, to do activities. And there is another level, is the investigating level, uh, carried out by a core group uh, constituted mainly by clinical psychoanalysts interest, interested in this in these works. For example, there is groups that are investigating the clinical methods operating in the analyst mind when he is practicing psychoanalysis. Other groups that are investigating what is specific of the psychoanalytic method after so many years of changes in the theory and in the technique. And also uh, interested in understanding, in better understanding, how operates the unconscious communication between an analyst presenter and a group uh, called an interanalytic group of, uh, of psychoanalysts. There is other groups that are interested in the changes in the patient's mind that has been submitted to psychoanalytic uh, treatment. And other groups, for example, interested in uh, establishing criteria to know when we have an uh, already trained candidate uh, to, to, to be a psychoanalyst. And the working parties. Uh, firstly, have been operating for many years in Europe, as Bernard afterwards will explain to us. And from there, they have been developed in the three IPA regions. Uh, and they have 
uh, after they have migrated to Latin America and to, to North America, what we can see uh, is that they have been very well accepted by the psychoanalytic community and uh, with a very large participation of psychoanalysts interested in, in, in knowing and, uh, and uh, to, to participate in this kind of activity. As we as a committee, we want to foster and to stimulate the working parties and working groups within the context of IPA, uh, because they were developed initially uh, in, the, in the regions by the federal, uh, the federal uh, federations, the, the regional federations of each region, but we wanted to foster this group in the IPA domain. Uh, at least for three reasons, for three reasons, uh, because they, uh, they help to meet the IPA strategic objectives. IPA has three strategic objectives, that is to stimulate the professionalism, to stimulate the promotion of, the promotion of psychoanalysis, and also the participation of the psychoanalyst in IPA activities. So we think that the working parties, they help to, to meet and to reach uh, the strategic objective of IPA. And also uh, they provide the IPA with the opportunity for further scientific activities beyond the IPA congresses. And we think that also uh, making uh, joint activities of the IPA Working Party Committee with the regional federations, this is a good way to strengthen the connection with the regional federations, to strengthen the connection of IPA with the regional federations. In addition, we want to encourage and to stimulate the working parties and working groups to achieve a greater level of abstraction and conceptualization of their work, stimulating them to participate in special scientific activities that we are promoting in the regions and in the IPA congresses, asking to the participants to present papers uh, in a format uh, to be published. So, we, we want to stimulate all the groups to work scientific papers to be presented in these scientific activities and also to be published in uh, scientific reviews, in the e-journal. And also we are planning to publish a book in the next year with this paper and with other papers that we will uh, ask for to the groups. Something about these joint activities. We are our, already having joint activities with EPF, with FEPAL, and we will have with NAPSEC and APSA. For example, we had joint panels with EPF in Warsaw, in Madrid, and there is a, pro a project to hold a new one in Vienna next year. With FEPAL, we had a satellite symposium in Lima, and uh, now we are planning to have another one in Uruguay in the next uh, FEPAL conference. And with APSA and NAPSEC, uh, it's planned also to hold a panel with the North American working, par working parties in 2020, now February, the next February. And in the, in the IPA Congress of London, uh, we, we, we hold uh, <clears throat> a satellite symposium with the participation of the North American uh, CCM, is the Clinical Comparative Method, the Latin American Working Party on Specificity, and also with the Clinical Observation Committee, having a very fruitful fruitful dialogue among these groups and uh, the papers that were written for this uh, satellite symposium was uh, around a central question that was how does the feminine appear in your working party or in your uh, working group 
And we think that this activity was really very important, not only from the scientific point of view, but also for getting the IPA members getting, getting closer from the, to the working parties and to their scientific productions. And uh, so this is a general overview about our committee and about the working parties. And I will ask now Bernard to, 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 to go on explaining us something more about the working parties and, and about our activities in Europe. Thank you very much, Ruggiero, for your clear overview of the story and activities of your committee. Uh, I'm sure your description of not only of the current situation, but also of all the potentialities uh, will open interest questions in the second section of our webinar. Well, now is the turn of our second panelist, Dr. Bernard Reith. Before handing over to him, I'll tell you briefly about some of his related scientific activities. Bernard is co-chair for Europe of the IPA Working Parties Committee. He's a training analyst and president of the Swiss Psychoanalytical Society. He's a past chair of the Working Party on Initiating Psychoanalysis of the European Psychoanalytic Federation. Well, Bernard, we'll hear to you. Thank you, Ines, and thank you, Ruggiero, for your, your very good overview. Um, so, I think my task is, one of my tasks is to describe how the working parties began, and then also to, um, to discuss, as Ruggiero asked, to discuss some of the commonalities um, between the working parties in their in terms of their methodology the um, the movement began around the year 2000 in discussions between Heidi Feinberg from Argentina but working in Paris and David Tuckett uh, from the United Kingdom who was then president of the European Psych Psychoanalytic Federation their concern was that the dialogue between psychoanalysts about their clinical work was not satisfactory. Um, we have in Europe um, a very rich psycholytic culture with people coming from different schools and different traditions within those schools, different linguistic areas and so on. And uh, this could be and now is a resource of really a richness, but it, at the time, the problem was that when psychoanalysts got together, they tended to supervise each other rather than trying to understand each other <laughs> and, you know, and telling each other how to work and that what they were doing was not good work and so on. And, and um, this was, well, it, was, it, it wasn't productive. So their concern was to find ways to get people to talk with each other in a way that they would really listen to each other and understand each other's work and um, to accept each psycholytic model as a valid model on its own and to try to understand, understand the specificity of each of these models within which people were working. Those were two, um, two main concerns um, and another main concern um, that they shared was that we wanted to find out um, how psychoanalysts really work because we have ideas about how we think that we work or that we should work and you know, also a lot of ideals but there was little discussion um, looking into what do we really do and 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 what do people in different models uh, really do within their models and are these models as different as we think they are and so on. This is a whole area that needed to be investigated and and from that point of view um, in Europe the the what um, what got started through after these discussions has really been very very successful the di the quality of dialogue in the european federation is has really changed and i think internationally also it is it has changed the other concern that um uh was also there was to do something as ruggiero was saying to do something along the lines of investigation in psychoanalysis 
um, there are people doing um, research in psychoanalysis in very specialized research fields and research domains, but practicing psychoanalysts were not involved in this usually and were uh, unfamiliar with research, afraid of it, and so there was also an idea of uh, to find ways to get analysts involved in doing something actively, something investigative in their own field, as a way also of um, trying to bridge the gap that was growing between psychoanalysis and the academic community, because there were fewer and fewer psychoanalysts working in academia, um, and there is a hope that, that, that if psychoanalysts can get used to um, doing this kind of work, they may also be better placed to discuss with people in academia about what psychoanalysis is and how it works and how we can look into how it works. So that was the, um, the research aspect, was looking at finding methods that psychoanalysts could use that would be con congenial to their way of thinking, that would be close to cl psycholytic clinical practice, and that would be meaningful to analysts. Many, many research methods are not directly meaningful to practicing psychoanalysis, not directly relevant to their clinical work, whereas the, the working party uh, methods were designed, tested to, to, to be relevant to, to clinical work. So that's, that's the way it started. Um, uh, Ruggiero has already described the different levels at which it takes place, that there's the, there are the workshops that bring together analysts, preferably analysts from working from different orientations, because the diversity of the participants in the workshops is very important. These, these people look at clinical material together um, and try to really understand what is happening in the clinical material, what the dynamics are, and how the psychoanalyst is working with those dynamics. Uh, there's also now, um, particularly in the clinical observation subcommittee, also a group trying to look at how the patient evolves in response to the analytic work uh, being done. It's, so it's all concentrated on what really happens in real psycholytic sessions. And then there's the second level of the core group um, whose task is to plan the workshops and provide the workshops with a, a method with which to work and to reanalyze the clinical material and to draw generalizable conclusions from the clinical material and then to use those to go back to the workshops to set up new workshops with perhaps slightly different questions that the workshops can work on and so on so as to keep a dynamic process going to keep an investigative uh, process going um, the First groups that began were Heidi Feinberg's listening to listening uh, group, which um, is still continued, but has always had a slightly separate status as a separate forum uh, within the whole working party effort. And the other initial group was comparative clinical methods, which is still going strong. Um, then other groups were added uh, to answer uh, different ideas about what we wanted to look at and so on. Um, initiating psychoanalysis was begun in, in 2004, has wrapped up its work now. Uh, we felt that we wanted to do a specific project and finalize it and finish and publish. Uh, the specificity of psychoanalytic treatment today was added in, I think it was 2005, and is still going strong. and. Uh, uh, one of the initial working parties also was uh, the working party on education in Europe, which has evolved into the end of training evaluation project, which is also still continuing. So there's, there's ongoing work. Um, I see time is running out. Um, perhaps just to say uh, a few words, and then we can perhaps go into this in more detail in the discussion if people are interested, is the 
how does the process work? What happens in these groups that make them um, significant, that make them interesting? Um, uh, one of the, I think, the main um, effective processes in this group is a, is a group dynamic process of residence to the clinical material. Different participants will pick up different aspects of the unconscious dynamics in the material and they will then share this with the other group members and you'll be sitting in a group and somebody in the group will see things in the material that you yourself have not seen or that will allow you to have a different take on the material than you would have had spontaneously and that is an extremely enriching experience for any psychoanalyst to have and um, it really strengthens your your sense of being a psychoanalyst to be able to exchange with people like this. Uh, um, so different participants resonate to different aspects of the material and allow the group as a whole then to come to resonate with this material. This is one um, common dynamic that has been described. Another uh, common feature of the groups is what we have called triangulation, um, is that the um, participating in groups like this allows you to take a more third-person perspective on your own relationship to the material, on your own relationship to your preferred psycholytic theories, um, to your own way of thinking psychoanalysis. And that form of triangulation happens in, um, in we think, at least two ways. Um, one way is triangulation between participants. When you see somebody else having a different take on the material, it, it leads you to think about your own take on the material, you know, on why didn't you see what the participant saw or what do you see that the other person didn't solve that, you know, so that it, it, it leads you to have a new perspective on your own way of thinking. And the other thing is the triangulation by the method. Um, because all working parties have methods we can go into details later, but all working parties have methods to keep people uh, focused on the real dynamics in the clinical material and not to start debating about what they think and their views and so on, just to an investigative procedure on the material. And there again, the method requires you um, to go back to the material to try to point out why you think you see in the material what you see and to discuss this with other participants. Not all working party methods do this, but many of them do. And um, even in um, a working party method like specificity, which doesn't usually ask specific questions to participants, there are procedural rules in the working party which oblige you to stack and listen and follow what other people are thinking and that in itself is a form of method uh, which again um, provides a means of triangulation um, with what's going on and then there's the um, final step in the third step is the whole step of data analysis which is a whole another thing but uh, my time is up, so we can come back to that later. But there's also questions about how to go through bringing together the findings from the different workshops. Just one point before I finish is that this involves huge numbers of analysts. Uh, in the initiating working party in Europe, we, there were about 500 psychoanalysts, 500 practicing psychoanalysts involved in the work of the working party over the 10 years that it was doing workshops. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, very much. Uh, you have been very clear in the description of how hard all these groups are working, trying to develop new psychoanalytic research procedures. Well, now it's time of our third panelist, Dr. Marie Ruben. Before handing over to her, I would like to say a few words about her related professional activities. 
She is co-chair for North America of the IPA Committee on Working Parties, co-chair of the North American Comparative Clinical Methods Working Oh, too bad. She's a training and supervising analyst at the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute and assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Wale Cornell School of Medicine. Well, Marie, if you'd like to begin. Thank you very much, Ines. Um, and thanks, Ruturo and Bernard. I thought for um, my talk, um, Ruturo and Bernard gave very good general introductions to how the work, what the working parties are in general. And I thought I would just say very a, a little bit about each of the working parties that's been um, uh, uh, working um, in North America, and then a little bit more about comparative clinical methods, just so you get a picture of how these parties actually work. Um, so uh, in North America, we have um, uh, several very active working parties. One is the end of training group, which Bernard mentioned. They focus on um, sessions with um, uh, candidates and supervisors. A supervisor presents them. And they look at parallel process between uh, in the material between the supervisor and the um, candidate. And also look at group dynamics and progression committees to see um, exactly, you know, what's going on when you evaluate a candidate for being ready. Um, and particularly looking at countertransferences that supervisors have to the candidate and to their patient. Um, specificity um, is uh, it, it developed a very interesting method of um, trying to find what's specific among all the different theories um, to psychoanalysis. And they decided to use a psychoanalytic um, way of a uh, 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 psychoanalytic methodology by by uh, through using free association. So session is presented uh, to the, a group um, without a lot of introduction about the patient or the treatment. And the group um, associates to the material in the sessions. And it's been discovered um, over time that actually the associations in the group wind up magnifying um, actually issues of transference and countertransference in the analytic pair. Um, uh, and um, Bernard mentioned clinical observations, and um, that's also a very active group in North America. Um, the comparative clinical methods group um, uh, basically aim to find a way, as Bernard said, to have analysts speak with each other and learn from each other about their different methods rather than argue. And also to try to be very specific about what it is that analysts are actually doing. Um, so the way that these groups are um, organized is that um, an analyst will present um, two or three sessions from an ongoing case, um, talk a little bit about the patient, um, the group who's present then can ask questions about the patient and about the what brought them into treatment, um, just to begin to try to understand how the analyst is thinking about this patient. Um, and then there are two steps that um, proceed. Step one is that every intervention or period of silence um, in the in each session is looked at separately along several parameters. Is what is the analyst trying to do with this intervention? Um, is there, uh, are they holding the frame? Are they trying to open up uh, an unconscious process? Are they trying to clarify or question something that the analyst has said? Are they focusing on some emotional fantasy meaning of what's come up in the treatment between the analyst and the analysand? Um, are they trying to give an elaborated meaning to things that have come up in several sessions in a row or to several um, associative trends that have gone on in this particular session? Um, also, there's another, uh, there's room for, um, is somebody making a, um, intervention that they later see as coming from countertransference or from an enactment. Um, and the analyst um, themselves use, uh, describes this as not their usual method. Um, after 
um, uh, basically interventions in psychoanalysis, as we all know, tend to be quite spontaneous and intuitive. But when you look over the course of several sessions, you see that basically analysts are using um, essentially um, they, they have a, a some they have a method to their madness, um, and we try to define that in step two by looking over the course of all the interventions. How does the analyst look at the patient? What do they think is wrong? So, what is their theory of psychopathology? Also, um, um, what does the analyst listen for? Are they listening for associations and what interrupts the associative trend? Are they um, listening for their own countertransferential reactions and what those tell them? Um, are they listening for affect uh, or for points of urgency in the session? Um, then we look at what, uh, what the analyst does to further the material, to further um, the treatment. So when they make an intervention, are they seeing this as contributing to the evolution of the, of the analysis of the patient ultimately benefiting from the treatment. And that's closely uh, connected to what is their theory of therapeutic action? How do they think anal analysis actually is working? And what is it aiming towards? Um, and, um, you know, so some analysts may feel that um, the best way they can um, help the patient is to become a different kind of object, a more forgiving or um, uh, uh, a tuned object. You know, others really are, are looking for underlying fantasy meeting and particularly for what emerges from the past in the transference. Um, finally, there is what is the theory of the analytic situation between the patient and analyst, and that is how does the past come into the present in the um, session at the moment, um, and generally that involves um, what's happening intersubjectively, is there enactment that the analyst is beginning to get a, a sense of, um, is there a transference fantasy that's becoming clarified? So um, we look at all of those different dimensions. And the work um, in comparative clinical methods groups, um, so we have these um, working groups of analysts who come and uh, listen to the sessions and work on them. And then we have the step three, which is the working party group that goes over. Our working party group has um, started to publish a number of papers um, of areas that we've become interested in and just going through our material. So we've written a paper about what do analysts really mean when they talk about working in the here and now. It turns out there are many different ways of working in the here and now, and we thought that it would be helpful to pinpoint how according to different analyst theories of how an analysis works, um, uh, what they look for and how, what they try to capture about what's going on in the session between the two of them. Um, we have another paper that we've worked on about um, what kind of object does the analyst become for the analysand. Often you feel a pressure as an analyst to become a certain way for the patient. And um, it's interesting to explore that um, what is the patient, how is the patient trying to shape the analyst? What do they want? What are they pressuring you to offer? And what does the analyst respond with? Is the analyst trying to be simply a neutral um, person? Uh, is the analyst trying to be a better than mother? Um, you know, um, there are lots of different um, approaches to that question. Um, we have also, um, uh, been looking at um, um, what um, what do analysts do? Analysts have, many analysts have a separate sense of what the transference relationship is and transference fantasies, and then some kind of notion of working alliance or what's the working relationship or how does the analysis build up trust. 
Um, and so we've been um, looking at, some analysts don't have a concept of working alliance at all. Some analysts combine both um, kind of fluidly. Um, um, but um, th that's an object of research. And then finally, um, for the recent IPA um, meeting uh, on the feminine, we explored um, different cases that we had heard in which um, analysts had developed strong erotic transferences to their analysts. And we are looking at how analysts from different um, theoretical backgrounds handle the erotic transference. Do they interpret it? Do they try to discourage it? Are they anxious about it? What do they do with that um, according to their theory? So those are some ways in which these um, uh, different working parties are um, uh, trying to come up and present our, our material. Thank you very much, Marie, for sharing with us your vast experience in these methodologies, your descriptions about the different stages and uh, and the mechanics of how it works have been really very clear. Thank you very much. Now the, is the turn of our fourth and final panelist, Agustina Fernandez. I would like to give you a little bit of background information about her professional activities. She's a member of the Argentine Psychoanalytic Association, co-chair for Latin America of the IPA Working Parties Committee, member of the Working Party on the Specificity of Psychoanalytic Treatment in Latin America Today, member of the Scientific Committee and professor at the Psychoanalytical Institute of the IPA, as well as being a co-chair of the FIBAL Working Parties Commission. Well, Agustina, are you ready? Okay, thank you very much, Ines. Hello to all of you. I'm very pleased to be part of this webinar. Thank you for having invited me. Well, I will talk about working parties in Latin America, developments and contributions. Let's start by the beginning in Latin America. Working parties arrived to the Latin America Psychoanalytic Federation by the way of European groups. The first pilot experiences in our region took place between 2000 and 29 in FIPAL and IPA congresses, but working parties officially began their activities within the framework of the pre-congress at the FIPAL congresses held in Bogota, Colombia in 2010. Since then, they have experienced significant growth and have made a great impact in the Latin American region they have had the support of the Latin American Psychoanalytic Federation, which within the scientific director, there is a special commission for the organization of the operation of the working parties. I was part of that commission over two periods uh, from 2012 to 2014 and from 2014 to 2016. This commission is currently coordinated by Maria Angelica Pacheco now. About the conformation of working parties here in Latin America. The working parties in our region are groups composed of analysts from different Latin American countries and societies, which meet to carry out research using a specific methodology. Some groups were developed from European working parties models, while others were initiated in the region. Now, within the, within the framework of the Latin American Psychoanalytic Federation, there were six functioning groups. They are Specificity of Psychoanalytic Treatment Today, the Feynman Method, Listen to Listen, Comparative Clinical Method, Microscopy of the Analytical Session, Unconscious Theory in the Analyst Mind at Work, and Clinical Observation Committee. Now, Working parties in Latin America today. The working parties have demonstrated important activity in Latin America over the last decade. 
their presence is strong in the congresses of the Latin American Psychoanalytic Federation, which take place once every two years. They are colleagues from different societies from all over Latin America meet to participate. As well, special events are held for working parties with psychoanalytic societies. Furthermore, the last five years, the activity of working parties has begun in the area of training analysts, meaning clinical groups of working parties are developed with candidates in the psychoanalytic institute. During the last Latin American, um, Latin American Psychoanalytic Federation Congress in Lima in 2018, the, wor the Working Party Committee of IPA, coordinated by Ruggero Levy, with whom I work as the co-chair from Latin America, we had worked together with the scientific director of the Federation to organize the first symposium of working parties in the region. The objective of this event was to stimulate scientific production and to create bridges of dialogue between the various groups of working parties. The symposium was organized around the following central question. How can each working party contribute to the study and research of the constructions and transformations that occur in psych psychoanalysis? It means in clinic, in theory, and or in analytical training. All the working parties groups from Latin America were invited to participate and to present their original works from their research and clinical workshops in the same posthum in order to deepen the theme of the FIPAL Congress at this time. Now I would like to talk to you about working parties in the training of analysts. Taking into, uh, into account that the effectiveness in the transmission of psychoanalysis that the experience of clinical groups have throughout our region, working parties have been included in the training of psychoanalysts. In the Ansel Garman Institute of APA, it means Argentine Psychoanalytic Association, for example, they are featured in the curricular program semin of seminars. In other societies, as the Uruguayan Psychoanalytic Society, for example, clinical working parties groups are organized as an extracurricular activity with candidates. As a coordinator of the working party on the specificity psychoanalytic treatment today, I personally had the opportunity, together with Abel Feinstein, to participate in this pioneer init initiative of working with working party device to carry out a seminar with colleagues in training in the Institute of Psychoanalysis of the APA. The working party on specificity works in clinical groups with the psychoanalytic method. That is, it invites the participant to speak freely associating and to listen with floating attention over several consecutive hours with the same clinical material. This allows us to capture and in turn deepen the commitment of colleagues in training with the dynamic of the unconscious. In the most successful experiences, the group functions as a catalyst that empowers the training and amplifies the psychoanalytic experience for both the presenter of clinical material and the participant. Furthermore, it reinforces the conviction in the unconscious and in the psychoanalytic methods as such. The work of working parties clinical groups consists in enable and privileging clinical exchange. Furthermore, Due to the characteristics of the devices, there are no passive expectators. By means of the methods, they promote clinical dialogue between colleagues. They foster the development of psychoanalytic listening and encourage a dynamic and live transmission of psychoanalysis. Finally, 
I am sure that those of us who have been participating in the working parties, as well as in the clinical workshops and in the research projects for several years now, as in my case, have had many enriching experiences. Among the most valuable and mainly take into consideration the interaction at the clinical level that occurs with colleagues in the workshops. I think, however, that it's important that things not only remain on an, an experiential level. For the solid developments of the working parties, it is necessary that the groups be able to transmit their findings to the psychoanalytic community. I consider it important at this point to exchange the work experience that this device has been developing in the three regions of the IPA, I mean the IPA. It is one of the objectives of our committee. In this regard, I thank very much the webinar organizing team for the possibility to make in a place for these valuable research and transmission devices of the psychoanalytic clinic, for having invited us to dialogue in this space, for making them known and disseminated. Thank you. Thank you, Agustina, very much for your overview on Latin American working groups. Now we have arrived to the second part of our webinar, the question and answer slot. We have received really many and very interesting questions. Well, I would like to begin with this one. It's addressed to the whole group. I noticed well, I, I send it so you can also read it. I would like, uh, I noticed that the classic way of giving clinical seminars has lost the ability to surprise candidates. It seems to me that these so useful methods are saturated. Do you believe that working group methods would be a good way to replace the current way? Yes, I can I can begin. I can begin. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I'm not sure if uh, the working parties can replace the seminars or the supervisions, but I am really sure that the working parties can help a lot in the analytic training. We are having a lot of experience in this kind of activities with candidates. In APA, as Agustina uh, recently uh, told us, uh, is the, in the Argentinian Psychoanalytic Society, but around the world, also in other institutes, we are having this kind of activities with candidates. In Porto Alegre, in Uruguay, in North America. So, and it's very interesting to see that uh, when the candidates participate in the workshops, first of all, they are really much more much more free to to free associate in the groups. They are not committed with one theory or with one authority position to uh, supervise the other. So they, we feel that they are really more free to free associate in the groups. And uh, at the end of the work, when we do the evaluation of the work, we see that this reinforced their uh, believement in the existence of the unconscious and that the free association really work as a way to know about the patient. So, so we are convinced that the, the, the working parties and the working groups are a very strong and very useful tool to stimulate and to help in the psychoanalytic training. Thank you. I, I, could, I could like yes, to, to say something in this point. 
Yeah, I, I would I would like to to be clear about this because um, in APA in our uh, society the curricula of seminars are are open. It means that candidates in training needs to successfully complete a total of twenty four seminars, and they but they are free to choose the seminars as long as they need a certain requirements. So working parties are part of this curricular, but so candidates can choose to take them or not, but they are not obligatory. I, I just would like to, to clarify this. Can I um, intervene? Yes, my no, please. Um, because I would, um, I, I want to agree with what's being said and also perhaps to um, remember that early on in his presidency of the IPA, Stefano Bolini, Bonanini suggested that there could be a fourth pillar to the to the training. Yeah, there's the, the personal analysis, supervision and seminars. And he suggested that uh, different forms of group work in small groups could be a useful addition to a fourth pillar of the training. And I do think that that Working parties are a very good way to do this. Now, where I would want to add to this is that um, I think we would be wrong to confine it to training. I, I think it's valid for analysts at every stage of their evolution and their practice. We all learn new things all the time by taking part in this kind of activity. So, you know, it's 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 not just for training it's for yeah. anal practicing analysts of every yeah. age <laughs> yeah I, I i think that it's uh, i totally agree with you bernard and i think that it's very important for trained analysts to time by time to take part in in one working party to retrain his listening and his uh, psychoanalytical attitude mm. I, I also um, think that it's a very useful way of um, really hearing in depth in, in the working party, the different parties, um, in depth material of, of work in sessions of analysts from very different backgrounds. And um, the method really forces you to really think carefully about what they're doing and to learn from them. So that I think it increases um, our repertoire in terms of, you know, understanding um, each other and learning from each other. Yes. And I think the candidates really benefit from that when they come to um, our sessions, um, that um, there's a kind of mutual respect and kind of searching to really understand what is happening in the psychoanalysis. Thank you, Marie. It seems that you all agree that working parties are a useful tool for lifelong training, no? Yeah. Well, we pass to the next question. The multiplicity of working parties' mothers might put a limit to the scientific exchange. If you agree with this idea, what resources are you planning for a greater integration among the different working parties' methodologies? Mm -hmm. um, I, yes, Maria? I actually think that each of them are working on something that's fairly specific. Um, it's very, it's been useful in the satellite symposium for the people working in the different working parties to hear more about what angle are, is your party, is your group taking on understanding um, psychoanalysis? Is, is it looking at, you know, underlying theories? Is it, um, or the consistency of an analyst's work? Is it looking at, um, uh, is it, uh, aimed at associating to the material to understand more about the transference and countertransference. I, I think that each of them have something to offer. I don't think that um, there's a cacophony um, of all kinds of different approaches. Uh, that They don't work at cross purposes. They each have a particular focus. 
that they've defined and a methodology that each one has developed. And I think you are seeing that each of them are starting to uh, come up with their own papers, um, which um, uh, look at psychoanalysis from one particular angle that's very useful. Mm-hmm. Sorry, yes. I, I think this question refers to something Ruggiero brings in his uh, text about how are you planning to overcome the isolation of the different oh, working I... groups, how to create bridges? Yeah, uh, f- first, uh, first of, I'm going to this point exactly. I, I want to to strengthen and to underline what Mary Redden said that uh, one of our goal is to uh, preserve the methodology of each working party, and uh, we think that the plurality of the working parties is part of is of his richness mm-hmm. and uh, because there is different uh, study objects that have and because of that that was uh, developed different methods to observe and to study the study object and uh, but uh, we had observed for many years that the working parties work at isolated one from the other, like islands, and also existing a kind of rivalry, a competition among the working parties. So we wanted to really create bridges to one to know the other, and to one to one could listen what the other is doing. And for that, We have been organizing uh, panels and satellite symposiums to do different groups of working parties to present their their material, uh, the data that they are uh, getting from their clinical workshops and to share one with the other and to really listen what the other is doing. And we had a very good experience now in London because I think that was a, 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 a really a moment that the groups could listen really in an open way about what uh, the other group is doing. Yeah. I, yes, I know. yes, I'd be interested to add to that. Um, I agree completely with what Ruggiero has said and also Marie before. Um, as, as, um, as you heard from my in my presentation i'm very interested in the epistemological commonality oh. that the differences are essential um uh it would be unscientific to think that there's only one scientific method um so um rather what rather than integrating the working parties i think that ruggero's expression of building bridges was the, was a, a good expression um, we are interested in getting people to talk about each other's methods so that we'd understand each other's methods better uh, but that does not mean looking for unified methods i think that would be a mistake it it, it would uh, impoverish the field rather than strengthen it. Thank you very much. Well, we pass to the next question. How do you take care of the confidentiality of the materials in the working parties that you wish to publish? I can, can I begin? Because we have, um, we have a publishing experience of, with wrapping up the, the work of the working party on initiating psychoanalysis, uh, which is on first interviews. And so first interviews necessarily contain a lot of information about the patient. And um, we found the process of publishing detailed material very complex. It was a difficult task. We thought we had to do it. 
uh, we were dealing with interviews presented by analysts who um, often felt that it was not ethical to discuss publication with the patient if for, for many reasons. As we know in analysis, this can be an ethical problem. We can intrude on the patient if we uh, discuss the publication of the material. Some analysts felt okay about uh, discussing it with, uh, with the patient. Um, so what we did was we tried to make sure to limit the information to the bare essentials that were needed to make the first interviews understandable, to make the unconscious dynamics of the interviews understandable. And we also worked with the analysts so as to try to disguise the cases, to put in decoys and so on as much as possible to make sure that the patient would not be recognizable. And finally, the main uh, method we had was that the analysts whose work was presented and discussed and published were anonymous. The book is published by the working party members, the core group members who were responsible for the work. But from the beginning, the rule has always been that the, the material presented by the analysts would be anonymous, that the presenting analysts would be anonymous. Those are the solutions we found. But it is a real, it is a big problem. It's a real issue that we need to continue to think about. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Marie, please. Um, yeah, so um, in, in, uh, we've done something very similar to Bernard. Luckily, um, with um, comparative clinical methods, we usually just, uh, we don't have to present a whole, you know, first interview. Um, so we, first we do work with every analyst. We get their permission and we disguise um, features of the, you know, of the analysis. And we often... Um, don't say very much about the analysis and at all, um, but we may focus on an interchange um, and they're brief interchanges usually between the analyst and patient. So, um, it, you know, I think that is help, that helps, but it's always a great concern of ours. And we always speak with the analyst about what we're doing and get their, um, <clears throat> get their permission. Um, I think because, as Bernard says, um, um, what's published is not under the name of the analyst. Um, you know, um, it, it would be hard for a patient to say, oh, my analyst wrote about me, you know. Um, so I, I think the um, we, we try our best so that it, it would not be at all identifiable who, um, who we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. We, we had the same problem uh, in specificity group. And for example, we wrote a paper to be presented in London, uh, in London now, sorry, in Boston, in Boston, about the apprehension of the unconscious, the unconscious of non-explicit material by an ether analytic group. And uh, to be exposed in Boston, it was okay because uh, the confid confidentiality was preserved. But to be published, we, 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 we had some difficulties, but uh, we think that if you can uh, disguise some aspects of the material and uh, by and, uh, and getting and uh, preserving the anonymous or, or the analyst anonymous, Perhaps it can be possible to be published, but really it's a it's a problem. But I think that we can surmount it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we pass to the next <coughs> question. <coughs> Are all working parties only about clinical work? The speeches of the participants till now have only dealt with the topic, this topic. Uh, no, uh, I, I can begin. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, there is one working party uh, called the End of Training. Uh, it's it's 
focused on uh, really on the on to to create criteria or to study criteria, the criteria that the supervisors use to understand when you have an analyst trained. So uh, it's very interesting because uh, the supervisors present reports about their experience uh, uh, in supervision with the clinical material that they are supervising with the candidates and the group studies or try to understand what which kind of criteria the supervisor is using to evaluate his candidate so and, and not has as bernard said before not to supervise the supervisor but trying to understand his criteria to evaluate this candidate so uh, so this is I, I think a good example of a working party that it's not focused on the clinic but uh, really on the training and uh, in the transformations that can occur in the identity of the candidate that is beginning a, a psychoanalyst i don't know if bernard marie or agustina can give other examples Yes, the, the, gladly, because it's an interesting, uh, an interesting problem. There were two, and an important problem, there were two um, uh, other working parties in the beginning that were set up in the European Federation. Um, one was a working party on interface, and particularly concerned with interface with academia. And another was our working party on theoretical issues. Uh, which looked into theoretical models using clinical material always because that's what we work on as analysts but using looking into our theoretical models and trying to compare theoretical models and that's been a very productive working party they've come out with uh, several publications um, uh, monographs um, the problem was that for various reasons including financial reasons it wasn't possible to continue with um, as many different groups, but it, our initial hope had been that um, we could um, dynamize the working party work also with working with these two other working parties, because for example, to have a working party on theoretical issues just to discuss with you, you know, how do you think your methods work? What do you think you can, the, are the conclusions you can draw from your findings and why and so on? What are your implicit theoretic theories involved and so on? Would be very, very interesting. So it could be, um, uh, it could be a useful contribution to the whole working party movement if we could revive that kind of working party, for example, yeah, you know, and to have discussions uh, it would enrich enrich the discussions mm -hmm. okay well I, I think it's fair play to transmit to you some comments I'm receiving like uh, very enthusiastic comments about your presentations and a huge amount of information so okay that's okay. why thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Another question. Uh, what a participant think that the IBA working parties have to deal mostly, if not exclusively, with clinical work as it was in their presentations? Sorry, could could you repeat the question, please? Okay. Uh, do, if you do, you think that the IPA working parties have to deal mostly, if not exclusively, with clinical work, as it was in their presentation. I guess that um, I guess that's a similar uh, question to the one that we answered. Yes, I think that we have already uh, reached or, or answered 
something very related to this very, question. Very, okay, so uh, we pass to the next one. You are defending the group free association as the better way to know the patient. But what about group dynamics? Would they strengthen the group identity but embarrass, embarrass the analyst unconscious functioning? Uh, very good question. <laughs> It's a very, very good question. It's something that um, we were particularly interested in in the um, in the initiating psychoanalysis uh, working party because we saw uh, one of our main findings was uh, had to do with the extremely intense unconscious dynamics at work in first interviews, and the way these dynamics could infect the workshops working on these groups and lead to uh, group enactments in the workshops um, which at first we thought were resistances to the dynamics and as we went on we saw that we could also understand them as uh, the group's way of trying to give expression two uh, important aspects of um, important usually unsymbolized and unelaborated aspects of the unconscious dynamics that were needing to be worked on and the one of the since since unconscious communication is very close to embodied nonverbal communication one of the ways this comes out is in um, in in the form of group enactments, people beginning to become upset or excited or uh, becoming too theoretical and cut off from the material and so on. So we we felt that um, uh, the group dynamics can infect the group. It is true, but if there's a group method that allows the group to be attentive to the dynamics, it can also become um, a very, very important source of information. Mm -hmm. And then again, the second look taken by the, um, uh, by the core working group, which goes through the whole material, because there are process procedures where usually these workshops are recorded. The recordings are listened to and um, noted down and then studied again in a second process and you can see these things happening and then the, the the core group going through the material can see the links between the group dynamics and um, and and what was there in the material and you can use that both to deepen the understanding of the group process and to deepen the understanding of the original material but it's a whole it's a whole issue for further exploration and for further studying. This, we're just beginning to understand this, and I think there's a lot more to be done about it. Yeah, we have we have exactly the the same experience in specificity groups yes. because they are groups uh, strongly based on the free association of the groups to uh, to the clinical material that is presented there, and very often we observe that in the group dynamics there is a kind of the group function as a box of resonance of uh, the what is happening in the clinical relationship and the psychoanalytical relationship between the analyst and his patients and very often we, we see in the groups or a kind of mirroring of what is happening on the analytic relationship such as enactments or uh, or reactions of the group to the moderators or reactions of the group to the analyst and it's very interesting because as bernard said we can deepen the uh, the understanding of the analytic relationship observing the group dynamics but there is and two more things i, I wanted to say and we, we have in many groups a, a very rich experience that, for, for example, the groups began to associate with a child abuse. But 
there is no material about child abuse in the explicit material that is presented. And, but this kind of association begins to, to exist there. And afterwards, when we listen, because the analyst is, uh, is uh, required in specificity groups to be silent. And it's very interesting that afterwards, when the analyst can speak, we see that in his history, there is something related to child abuse. And the repetition of this kind of experience in the groups uh, show us the strong capacity of the groups to apprehend some unconscious aspects that there was not explicit in the material that was presented. But another thing that I wanted to say about the group dynamics, it's, it is that is very a subtle uh, difference to use the group dynamics to understand what is happening in the analytic relationship and to be very careful to not transform the group in a therapeutic group. So the interventions of the moderators yes. have to be very careful to not use the dynamic groups as a kind uh, to, to transform it in a therapeutic group, but have the ability to use the dynamic group just to understand the clinical material. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm passing to the next question. My experience is that within the work of the working parties, a sense of community, collegiality, and in intimacy seems to develop greater than within panels, discussion groups, and, and the like, at the, no, at the subsequent Congress. As a result, I have found working groups to be an excellent threshold to the Congress itself. Any thoughts about why that is? Hmm. It's a nice question. Yes, I, I, I can begin. Uh, Mary, please, please. Okay. Please, Mary. Hmm. Go ahead, Richard. Oh, okay. well, uh, I think this is a very important question because I think that the experience to participate in uh, working party groups uh create because the groups is a deep in experience of many hours of 12 hours that people is invited to work together to listen one to the other respectfully and uh, having the principle that uh, all the contributions are important to the understanding of the material that there is not uh, one theory or one technical aspect that is uh, prevalent over the other, that all the technical contributions or theoretical contributions or associated or image that uh, occur to, to a participant are important to construct the understanding. So people feel that his contribution is very respected and very useful to the work. And due to the fact that people work together for so many hours, difference than that uh, going to listen a conference or lecture or a panel, that people is there just uh, listening or participating in uh, two or three minutes. In the, in the workshops, people has the opportunity to work for 12 hours explaining and listening and working together and in general at the end of the work people said share a kind of uh, common uh, uh, i don't know how to say but to, to a, a common uh, a feeling of be uh, participate in 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 a, in a kind of community Mm -hmm. and uh, and a lot of participants uh, say that uh, at the end of the groups in the pre-congresses 
that for them the Congress is already over because they have a so intense experience in the group that is very gratifying uh, to the participants. Marie, please. Um, yes, I, I, I agree with Ruggiero. I also think that um, if you're reading a paper, uh, you have a lot of control as the presenter over what you're going to say. In the working party groups, the presenter um, it does something that's quite courageous, which is open up their material for a long and very close examination. And I think, and the methodology methodologies are built to respect that and to do it in a very task-oriented way. So you have a small group of people working together on a task and they're working to make themselves very vulnerable. And I think um, that does create a certain intimacy and um, it, it underlines the respect. And finally, I think small group dynamics are um, easier to um, look at and to, um, uh, you, you know, we always comment on the group, um, uh, what the group may be showing. And um, I think small groups are tend to be more intimate than a larger, you know, seminar where lots of voices are heard and, you know, people are fighting for airtime. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we are on time. Um, I don't know if you want to add any other comment. No, we, we, I think that we want just to, to, to thank uh, for everybody, for the webinar organizers, uh, for giving us this opportunity to present our work, uh, the work of the working parties, and also to, to thank to all the, the participants and to all the audience to the questions, to the interest in to know to know about uh, about our activity. Yes. Well, uh, <clears throat> I um, really um, I would say in the same line than Ruggiero that uh, we are very grateful for all your contributions four of you and also the attendees because you you have created a very lively and dynamic uh, uh, community of ideas it's, uh, it's not only highlighting the special value of working parties in the transmission of clinical experience and as a new research procedure it's, it's also the importance of what you have just said about how participating in these groups contribute to the strengthening of the links among the members of our scientific community. So it's Absolutely. not only an important threshold to the Congress, it's important to uh, create this uh, lively feeling of community. Well, I want to um, announce our next webinar it will take place on September 28th. At that time, we'll discuss refugees and immigrants. How can psychoanalysis contribute? We hope uh, you will join us again. Well, we we'll wait for you. <laughs>